Hello, my name is Ashley Hollinshead. I am a full-time guide here at Monticello, and I wanna welcome you all to our Monticello Voices presentation. Oftentimes when people visit Monticello, we imagine this as being solely the home of Thomas Jefferson, author of the American Declaration of Independence, third president of the United States. But Monticello was so much more than just a home. In fact, Monticello was an entire plantation the majority of the people who lived here at Monticello were enslaved African-Americans. We're standing here along Mulberry Row, which was the industrial center for that vast Monticello plantation. Try to imagine originally along this road about 20 buildings lighting either side. This is where enslaved laborers, they crafted furniture, they forged metals, they wove textiles, they managed horses. Try to hear the sounds that would have been coming from Mulberry Row, perhaps from the nailery here. James Hubbard, as he swung his hammer 20,000 times in a single day, I have to wonder if he ever dreamed of freedom. Try to imagine the smells wafting down from the kitchens where Edith Fawcett, the head enslaved chef, she crafted very intricate and elaborate half French, half Virginian foods. And bound by an institution where the only thing that was certain was uncertainty, I have to wonder if Edith Fawcett ever feared the separation of her family. Join us as some of my colleagues share with you all the stories of the people, the families who lived here at Monticello 200 years ago. John Hemings was one of the enslaved men here at Monticello. He was an enslaved joiner. He was apprenticed to Jefferson's Irish craftsman named James Dinsmore and one of the enslaved people tasked with building his home. John Hemings over the years perfected his trade and his craft and he also ends up being one of the main men responsible for building Jefferson's retreat home called Poplar Forest outside of Lynchburg in Virginia. As you look at Monticello behind me and you look at what it embodies, when you look at the Greek and Roman architecture that it inspires and those ideals of the revolution on freedom, equality, and liberty for all, please keep in mind that this home was made by the hands of those who were not free, men like John Hemings and other enslaved people who lived and labored here at Monticello. So not only is it a monument to America and to freedom and liberty, but it's also a monument to the enslaved people who crafted this home. The space behind me is a joinery, the space in which John Hemings would create many of his masterpieces while he was here on the property. Now, the story I'm gonna tell is of a similar craft and a man who was leading that. So the similar craft itself was the smithery, so the workings of iron and steel here on the property. And the man who would help lead that process would be Joseph Fawcett. Joseph Fawcett would gain an adeptness at working these two materials during his adolescence from the years of 12 to 16. He would split his time both between the house and inside of the nailery. But when he turned 16, he becomes specified to continue work in the nailery and the smithery itself. And so throughout his time here at Monticello, he'll gain that adeptness in the working of these materials, so much so that he would eventually become foreman of the smithery itself. And upon Thomas Jefferson's death in 1826, he would become a free individual, one of those five people that were freed in Thomas Jefferson's will. Unfortunately, in contrast, his family, so his wife and his children were still enslaved here at Monticello. Here we are in the kitchen. Now, Edith Fawcett was the head chef at Monticello at the end of Thomas Jefferson's lifetime. And she would learn cuisine at 15 years old when she'd go to the president's house with Thomas Jefferson during his presidency and learn the art of French cuisine. So for seven years, she'd be trained and eventually come back here and return to Monticello. Now, she and Joseph would have 10 children together. I remind you that Joseph Fawcett was freed in 1826 upon Thomas Jefferson's death, but the rest of his family was not. And so Joseph Fawcett, with the aid of his brother-in-law, would work at that freedom of Edith and their children. And they would eventually gain freedom for some of the children as well as Edith, and then they'd leave and go to Ohio where they'd set up roots. Now the Fawcett family is a testament to this black perseverance that we see commonly in these enslaved narratives. And throughout their hard work and throughout this constant fight, they're able to finally attain this family unit in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, as a toddler, Sally Hemings moved to Monticello after Jefferson inherited her family from his father-in-law, a man named John Wales. Now, John Wales was also the father of Jefferson's wife, Martha. And John Wales had fathered children with one of his slaves, a woman named Elizabeth Hemings. Now, together, Elizabeth Hemings and John Wales had six kids. One of them was a female named Sally. 
So in essence, Jefferson's wife Martha and Sally Hemings were half-sisters because they shared the same father. Now it was very common for white male owners to take advantage of their enslaved female property. African American women and girls had to endure the threat and practice of sexual exploitation. There are no safeguards to protect them from assault or to be used as long-term concubines by masters or slaves. Enslaved females could not say no, for consent does not exist in a master and slave relationship. Enslaved men, for their part, were often powerless to protect the woman they loved. And regardless of their white paternity, children born to enslaved women inherited their mother's status as slaves. And this salient aspect about slavery is something that Sally Hemings would have been fully aware of by the time she's 14 years old and traveling to France with Jefferson's younger daughter, Mariah. Now, at some point in France, Jefferson and Hemings formed a connection. This connection lasted 30 years and resulted in six kids of their own, four that survived to adulthood. Their names were Beverly, Harriet, Madison, and Eston Hemings. And during Jefferson's first term as president, a journalist by the name of James T. Callender published in a newspaper, quote, by this wench Sally, our president has fathered several children. The African Venus is said to officiate as housekeeper at Monticello. And in time, to the white readers in America, she was known as Dusky Sally, Yellow Sally, by this wench Sally. Her gender and her status as a slave precluded her from speaking out and proclaiming Me Too. Jefferson never publicly or privately commented on the allegation. Sally Hemings left no written records. We'll never know what she thought or how she felt. But what we do know is that just like countless enslaved women throughout America, Sally Hemings bore children fathered by her owner, Thomas Jefferson. Now in the 1870s, their son, Madison Hemings, delivered a testimony where he recounted how in France, Sally Hemings was technically free. She agreed to return to enslavement at Monticello in exchange for extraordinary privileges for herself and freedom for her unborn children. And over the next 32 years, Sally Hemings raised her four kids and prepared them for their eventual emancipation. When each child reached the age of 21 years old, Thomas Jefferson freed all four children. Beverly and Harriet Hemings left Monticello in the early 1820s. Madison and Eston Hemings were freed in Jefferson's will and left Monticello in 1826. As for Sally Hemings, she never negotiated for or ever received legal freedom in Virginia. And though she remained enslaved, she still helped shape her life and the lives of her children who got an almost 50 year head start on emancipation escaping the system that had engulfed their ancestors and millions of others. She achieved what no other enslaved woman at Monticello achieved, the freedom of all of her children. She lived long enough to see her first grandchild born free in the house her son's own. And she severed the hereditary condition that had trapped her mother and even grandmother. In the past, she might have been known to many white Americans as Dusky Sally, but today we give back her humanity and we recognize her as Sally Hemings. A daughter, a mother, a sister, a seamstress, a negotiator, and a liberator. So here we are in the Getting Word Project Room, which focuses on reaching out to those descendants of those enslaved here at Monticello to regain those stories that may have been lost over time. The Fawcett family is one of those families that we were able to reach back out to and gain stories from over 20 different descendants of Edith and Joseph Fawcett. Now, one of their most famous descendants is William Trotter. He was a Harvard graduate who graduated magna cum laude. And throughout his lifetime, he worked diligently with civil rights and trying to develop equity here in America. So much so that he actually helped found, with the help of W.E.B. Du Bois, um, the Niagara Movement, which served as a foundation for the NAACP. 
William Trotter would help develop and create this movement toward diversity and equity here in America. And Monticello is trying to keep this going with these continuous conversations through our Getting Word project. Directly behind me, you can see what were the original fields here at Monticello, these green fields in the distance. Those marked the outer extent of this plantation. Those are the fields at a quarter farm that was called Tufton here at Monticello. And so try to picture in the distance even more cleared fields where generations of enslaved families like the Grangers, the Evanses, the Hubbards, the Gillettes, they labored from sunup to sundown six days a week, often under the supervision of violent overseers to cultivate tobacco and wheat cash crops. It's this institution of slavery that kept families and individuals here at Monticello enslaved solely because of the color of their skin, these false beliefs of a racial hierarchy that continue to impact the United States of America today. And we see over the past 250 years, people like William Monroe Trotter, people like Martin Luther King Jr., uh, people like Peter Fawcett, all struggling to create a better future, a place where the United States of America truly upholds those ideals in its founding document, that all people are created equal with those rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The nail shop was a way for Thomas Jefferson to generate a secondary source of income to also supplement the income that he was making from the wheat fields here at this plantation. Each day, Thomas Jefferson himself would come out here and weigh nail rod in order to give to the enslaved boys who'd be working in this nail shop. Of course, each enslaved boy, aged 10 to 21, would be producing at least 1,000 nails a day, and the nail shop itself would produce anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 nails. This was long work, it was very hard, and tedious and repetitive. Here in the nail shop, if young men were productive, they would be sent to learn trades, such as blacksmithing or carpentry work. If they were not productive, they would be sent into the ground, as Thomas Jefferson called it, which would mean they would be sent to work in the fields of Monticello, harvesting the wheat crop. The story that I'm about to tell you about this nail shop involves two young men who are working in here in 1803. One of the young men, named Brown Colbert, perhaps as a tease or prank, took and hid nail rod from one of his fellow workers named Carrie. In retaliation, Carrie will then take a hammer and hit Brown Colbert in the head with it, fracturing his skull. Brown Colbert will then enter into a coma. In retaliation to this, Thomas Jefferson will take Carrie and he will sell him down south. Jefferson said that he did this in terrorism to the other enslaved boys to be working here as a way of policing the actions air in the nailery. Of course, this action was a form of punishment used at Monticello, selling someone away from their friends and family as so they would never be heard of again here on the plantation. Of course, this is just one of the many terrors of slavery here at Monticello. Slavery here at Monticello is no different than slavery anywhere else in the southern United States within that time period. Slavery, of course, was a violent act based on coercion and terror. Many of the enslaved people here lived in the fear of what would happen to them if they misbehaved. They could have been whipped, they could have been sold away from their families. And Thomas Jefferson, despite writing his words in the Declaration of Independence, and despite calling slavery a hideous blot and a moral and political depravity, still practiced this form of terror here at this very plantation. So Monticello, it's an Italian term that means little mountain. And if you look, the larger mountain was also part of Jefferson's plantation. Uh, he named it Montalto, which I'm sure you can guess means high mountain. And under the shadow of Montalto, you can see, again, the vegetable garden and a small pavilion, which was based on Jefferson's design. This recreation shows the kind of place where perhaps Thomas Jefferson would look off into the horizon below. And if you look at the gardens themselves, you can imagine the kind of labor that went into working these grounds. The head gardener here was an enslaved man named Wormley Hughes, a member of the Hemings family. Wormley Hughes began his first training in botany under a Scottish gardener named Robert Bailey when he was only 13 years old. And throughout the rest of Jefferson's life, if there's reference to someone here digging in the garden, it's almost always Hughes, the man who would direct the planting here and who would do most of the physical labor. And people often say Thomas Jefferson was a gardener and would call himself a farmer. Whereas that is true, uh, there's some difference in being a gardener and a farmer as a plantation master two centuries ago and being the person who does the physical labor. 
In fact, one of the memoirs from a man who was enslaved here, Isaac Granger made reference to Thomas Jefferson working out in the gardens below. He said, for amusement, he would sometimes work in the gardens in earnest for 30 minutes or more in the cool of the evening. So it's not as if Jefferson was never here, but it is certainly the case that the man most responsible in later years for the production of this garden was Wormley Hughes. Just over my shoulder here is a reconstruction of uh, the type of cabin that an enslaved family would have lived in. Uh, in one of these cabins, there could have been 10 to 12 uh, people working, living, um, eating, cleaning, all of those types of things together as a family. Uh, this cabin specifically has been decorated to look like uh, the one that uh, John and Priscilla Hemings would have shared. Priscilla Hemings uh, worked as a caretaker, um, caring for Jefferson's grandchildren. Uh, mostly. Now John and Priscilla Hemings uh, spend a long life uh, together um, in terms of their marriage, but physically they spend most of it not near each other. For 19 years of their marriage, Priscilla Hemings, along with Jefferson's grandchildren, uh, are living at Edge Hill, the plantation that belonged to Jefferson's daughter uh, and her husband, Martha Jefferson Randolph and Thomas Mann Randolph. Uh, so for 19 years, uh, they are separated from each other physically. Uh, now, they're only three miles away. Uh, it might as well have been 300. Eventually, they move back here to Monticello, and John and Priscilla Hemings are reunited. And then only a couple of years later, John Hemings is sent to go oversee that construction at Poplar Forest, and so they're separated for another six years. How do you maintain uh, a union, uh, a bond such as theirs, in the face of so much separation from each other? Uh, and we see that John Hemings, uh, while he's at Poplar Forest, was actually writing letters to Jefferson's youngest granddaughter, whose name was Septimia. And so we see that he's writing letters to this 11-year-old child talking about uh, updates on the work that he's doing, uh, some speculation as to when he might be able to come back to Monticello. Is he writing those letters uh, to Septimia because he wants her to be aware of what's going on in his life and he wants to update her? Uh, maybe. Is he writing those letters to her because he's trying to, to talk to the person who's most likely to be in the room, the person who's most likely to be helping Septimia read those letters, uh, and that's Priscilla. Um, also, maybe. Now, separation was um, a constant fear and reality for enslaved laborers here at Monticello. Uh, it was a tool used to coerce them into doing the things that uh, their owners wanted them to do. It was used as a consequence for some whenever they did actions that their owners perceived to be wrong. Uh, and it was also sometimes just used on the whims of the people that owned them. Another example of that we see is in the life of Nancy Hemings, who is another sibling of John and Sally Hemings. Uh, now she grows up being trained as a weaver, uh, starting at the age of 13. Uh, and she becomes a very skilled weaver uh, until in 1785, Jefferson gives her and her youngest two children, gives them away as a wedding gift to Jefferson's younger sister, Anna Scott Marks. Now, they go to live in Richmond uh, on that plantation, and they're there for 10 years. So they're, they're separated from the rest of the Hemings family. Uh, and in that 10 years, they start to uh, live their lives there, start to create what their new life is going to look like. And then 10 years pass, and Jefferson now wants another weaver, another skilled weaver, to come back to Monticello. So he asks his sister if he can buy um, Nancy Hemings back. And he does, but he doesn't buy the two children. So Nancy Hemings is separated from her children. Uh, she's separated from her family members again and brought back here to Monticello. Uh, the two children would later be separated from each other as well. So the separation of different enslaved families at Monticello uh, happened constantly. Uh, and often they were sold or given away and separated just to different members of the Jefferson Randolph family, uh, often living on nearby plantations or in neighboring counties. Uh, and even when those family members were constantly moving and relocating, sometimes even coming back to live here at Monticello, uh, would those enslaved families get to see each other again? Would they get to reunite with their loved ones? Uh, sometimes, uh, but even then the answer was often still no. When Thomas Jefferson and Jupiter Evans were born in 1743, 
Slavery had been a part of Virginia's landscape for almost 120 years. It had evolved and developed and matured, and it was a system that was based on ideas of a racial hierarchy, ideas that had no basis in science or fact. It was also hereditary through one's mother. If a woman was enslaved, any and all of her children inherited that status regardless of who the father was. And thirdly, it treated human beings as property. Thomas Jefferson and Jupiter Evans grew up together, no doubt developed complicated feelings for one another during those years. But when Jupiter Evans passed away in 1800, Thomas Jefferson commented, saying that I am sorry for Jupiter, but I am also sensible that he leaves a void in my domestic administration that I cannot fill up. One way people like Thomas Jefferson sought to justify slavery, something that they knew was wrong, was by viewing those people they enslaved as less than, people that were inferior, people who didn't have the same feelings or emotions as Jefferson did. He viewed them as property. And his grandson years later echoed that sentiment when he said, having the dual aspects of persons and property, the feelings for the person were always impairing its value as property. Now here at Monticello, our job and our responsibility is to tell the stories of these individuals and recognize them in a way that Thomas Jefferson never was able to, recognizing them as people. And it's through their stories that we see sources of hope, inspiration, and perseverance of the human spirit. So we are standing here on the west lawn of Monticello. Behind me is that iconic, what we call nickel view of Monticello. This is the uh, side of the, the house that we see featured on the back of the United States nickel. The architecture of Monticello is so unique. This is what gives it a designation as a United Nations World Heritage Site. Monticello is the only presidential home in the United States that has this designation. Monticello is also the only site of enslavement here in the United States that's designated as a World Heritage Site as well. When we think about Monticello and what's happening here even after Thomas Jefferson's death, about six months following his death, there was an estate sale, an auction that was held here. Imagine this entire mountaintop turning to, into one large auction block. Thomas Jefferson had passed away deeply in debt and to reconcile these debts, his family held this estate sale in which they sold the house, most of its contents, and 130 enslaved men, women, and children. Imagine it being a cold January day. 130 people are waiting to know their fate. Joseph Fawcett, he was one of only five people that Thomas Jefferson freed in his will. He stood at this estate sale, this auction, and watched his wife and their children put up for sale and sold. 130 enslaved men, women, and children separated from friends, separated from family. Monticello is a site of many different stories. It's a site of many different perspectives. Historian Reese Isaacs, he says that to be a person is to have a story. To be denied a story is to be marked for obscurity and oppression. In Monticello, the stories of the enslaved people here, they illustrate that the institution of slavery, it affected people, individuals and families free and enslaved black and white and more. Monticello, the stories of the people here, the stories that you've heard today, they open a window into the resiliency of the human spirit and the ingenuity needed to one day fully realize this promise of America, this promise that all people are created equal with rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.